My name is Carl Hughes, and I'm the engineering manager at PackBackBooks.com. If you're in journalism, communications, or pretty much any field these days, you're likely going to be publishing or putting stuff out on a website, and it's very possible that you're going to encounter the people who make websites work, or maybe even want to become one of them. So my goal today is to give you just a brief introduction to the technology and processes that go into websites, some of the terminology behind it, and hopefully keep it non-technical enough that anybody can understand, but go deep enough to keep it interesting. So Packback Books does daily digital textbook rentals, meaning you can pay a few bucks for every day that you use your textbook rather than two or three hundred dollars up front from the campus bookstore. If you want to check out Packback Books, see if we've got your textbooks for college, go to packbackbooks.com. So here's a video from 1994 that shows you how much things have changed on the internet uh, and having to do with the internet in the last 20 years. 56 pass, I wasn't prepared to translate that as I was doing that little tease. Oh, that's that right. That little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At? See, that's what I said. Mm-hmm. Um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard it. Around I'd never heard it said. Back. I'd always seen around. the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. <coughs> yeah, I heard something around big fight up in the lunchroom the other week. There it is. Violence at NBC. G E com. I mean, well, what well, Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network, mm -hmm. the one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. It, I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Oh, <laughs> oh. Allison will be in the studio shortly. What, is, what does it mean? It's a, it's a giant computer network made up made up of uh, started from. Oh, I thought you were going to tell us what this was. It's like a, look a in computer the dictionary. billboard. It's, it's not in it. It's it, it's it's a computer billboard, but it's nationwide, right. and it's, it's several uh, universities and everything all joined together. And right. And others can access it. And, right. And it's getting bigger and bigger all the time. Just it came great. in really handy during the quake. A lot of people, that's how they were communicating out to tell family and loved ones they were okay because all the phone lines were down. I was telling Katie and I was But you don't, need, you don't need that? You don't need a phone line to operate no. internet? So just 20 years ago, Brian Gumbel and Katie Kirk on the Today Show couldn't even explain what the internet was, uh, much less the at symbol for emails. It, the internet has changed our language, it's changed the way we distribute content, and it's changed the kind of content that we can distribute, and it's now reliably accessible in your pocket at any time. So I think it goes without saying that it's important to know how the internet works, but to most people it's unfortunately just like a black box, it's magic. Uh, so if you're, you're probably familiar with the interfaces you use to access the internet, apps, web browsers, etc., but you probably don't know much about how it works behind the scenes. And so today I'm going to explain the basic process of how accessing a website works. Uh, just so you know, I'm going to use a simple analogy that um, you guys are probably familiar with. It's basically just a lot like sending really quickly, uh, fast letters uh, through, the, through the web. Uh, I'm going to walk through an example of accessing Facebook.com, a website that probably everybody listening to this has accessed at some point or another. And I'm going to show a demo of what happens behind the scenes by peeling back the layers and getting into a little bit of code. But don't worry, I'm not going to try to overwhelm you. I'm going to keep this as simple and surface layer as possible. So let's just start with a part of this that you're already somewhat familiar with, your own computer. There are basically three things that your computer needs in order to access the internet. The first is called an IP address. An IP address is a lot like a mailing address or a return address for a letter. It's basically just a universal location that other computers can use to send you information. And so when you are creating what's called a request that we'll get into in a few minutes, you're going to be sending along with your request a return address in the form of your IP address. And your computer automatically gets one assigned to you. You don't have to do any work to get this. The next part that you need in order to access the internet is a physical or wireless connection. Uh, somewhere it's got to connect to the wall and then go out of your house and access the rest of the network of cables that, that make up the internet, these computers connected to one another. And this is a lot like a mailbox because it's sort of your access point with the outside world. And finally, you need a browser, which are a lot like reading glasses in that they help you form a letter and then get read letters that come back to you. Uh, it's going to read what's called the response, and it's also going to help you build your request. So let's talk now about what happens when you type a web address in your browser 
you click enter where did things go so your browser is going to put together what's called a request this is a lot like a letter your reading glasses are going to help you make sure that it looks good it's going to shore everything up seal it up you click enter in the web address bar and this seals letter puts it in the mailbox which is once again your connection to the outside world so this request is just a bunch of data a bunch of letters or numbers or whatever some kind of code that gets sent out through the internet and the web address that you typed to send that request to is a lot like the general mailing address for a place you don't know exactly what person is going to open that letter you don't know exactly how it's going to get there which office unit it's going to get to but you have faith that it should work it's kind of like when you fill in your taxes you send your your tax forms back to the IRS's general emailing address and then along the way the IRS processes it and some random guy in the organization is going to actually open your letter and distribute the work as necessary your computer's request is a lot like that. It goes to a very general place. And your computer's request, say for www.facebook.com, goes off to next, a DNS server. So this is a lot like the sorting uh, offices in the post office, where basically you've put in a very general web address, and it knows exactly where it is, how to get there, which mail carrier should take it, and if the address is valid or not. DNS stands for Domain Name System. These are basically computers that just keep records of which web addresses should go to which IP addresses. Remember in the second or very first slide, we talked about IP addresses. Those are like permanent mailing addresses for computers. So this domain name server or computer keeps a record of when someone types www.facebook.com, what IP address or what computer should that go to? This all happens in fractions of a second, but it's a lot like the process that the Postal Service does when it keeps people's addresses on record along with their zip code and any other information they need. So these DNS servers, domain name service servers, will take your request, these computers take your, this request to Facebook.com and turn it into a request for a specific IP address, like we see here. And that gets sent off to one single computer. Now this computer uh, that Facebook has registered with this one IP address is going to do all sorts of work on it and it can be just about anything. I mean computers can do a lot these days. Servers are the are, are basically just bigger versions of your laptop or computer at home. They can do things like make sure your input is valid. They can get info from a database. They can call other servers to get information. They can do complicated math and logic and pretty much anything else that your computer can do at home and more. A server has a single IP address, like I mentioned before, so it's just one individual address. But in reality, because <clears throat> Facebook gets so many requests coming in, no single computer could handle them all. So what they'll do is this one server, this one IP address, will then send out to a bunch of other second or third tier servers. So for example, let's say Facebook's single server gets all gets your request. It could send part of that request out to server two and part of it out to server three and make sure that those responses come back and piece them together. Then it's not doing as much of the work itself. What the server does is it can run through all this different logic, do all these programs on your request, and eventually what it's going to do is create what's called a response. This is a lot like a return letter, an automated return letter. And inside of it are, is code that only your browser can read. This comprises HTML and CSS, which uh, once again is like a secret code that you can't read without your glasses. It's going to have some JavaScript, which is adds basic logic to a web page and it can turn it into a moving document. We'll go over all three, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in a little bit. And it can include special res response codes. For example, you've probably seen a 404 page somewhere on the internet or a 500 server error page. Basically, these are ways, these are codes that are sent to let your browser know that something went wrong. But if nothing went wrong, the response code will be 200. Bad response codes are a lot like getting a letter back when you have insufficient postage. It means that it's gotten part of the way there, but it didn't make it all the way. And now you'll have a chance to resend it, but it didn't work this time. Once a response is generated, it goes back through the mailbox connection to your IP address and into your browser. Now remember when the request was made, it sent along as a return address the IP address of your computer so that Facebook or whoever's server knows where to send the response back. 
your browser gets the response from the server out in the the internet wherever other computer and then it's going to interpret it as something that's human readable that you can understand once again it's a lot like you're reading glasses so let's go with a more specific example and kind of walk through what it might look like when you type in www.facebook.com into your web browser your browser uses its connection to the internet and your computer's IP address to generate a request it's just a bunch of data that you want to get to this website now this request is pretty simple to start with it's just got a web address that you want to go to facebook.com and your return address your IP address it may have some other information that your browser has kept stored about you as a user and the way you use that website for example logged login information or something like that this request goes off to a DNS server that's in charge of Facebook.com. Facebook.com has actually bought space and DNS servers that link Facebook.com to individual IP addresses or one IP address. So Facebook <clears throat> has told the DNS servers that are just out there as public registries uh, that we want all requests to Facebook.com to go to this one single server or these, this group of servers. This server, when it gets your request, is going to see it, and if it recognizes your computer by the return address and the other data the browser sent along, it might send, along, send back a different response based on what it knows about you. That's why when you go to Facebook and you're logged in, it's going to send you, it's going to show you your news feed. If you're not, it's going to show you the login or sign up form. So the website server dictates what the response is going to be that your browser is then going to see. So that's just a basic overview of the request and response cycle. Remember, website servers are just like your computer. They've got an IP address, they're connected to the internet, and they may even have their own ways of accessing other information from other web servers. If you've got questions about this stage and the response request cycle, feel free to shoot me an email, or you can do a little bit of searching around for some more info. Here's some resources that I've found helpful in the past. If you want to read some articles about responses, requests, websites, web pages. Wikipedia has several good ones on web pages and servers that you might want to check out or HowStuffWorks.com and look up the internet, uh, DNS servers, look up web pages, all that is listed on HowStuffWorks and it gives you a very good visual simple overview without getting overly technical. If you're more interested in the applied knowledge of building a personal website, check out collegeinfogeek.com and uh, do a search for personal website. It's a really good step-by-step -step overview of how to set up a website, get, get server space uh, for yourself, and minimize your costs. Uh, our friend Thomas Frank put that up, and it's really great, great um, overview. And then you should also check out w3schools.com and codecademy.com. These are both places that have tutorials and walkthroughs for learning to code, even just basic HTML and CSS. And we'll do a little bit of that in a second. But um, if this whole little walkthrough here was too elementary and you're really looking for something a little more in depth, here's some deeper topics that you can start Google searching. There's server and client side programming or scripting, which basically is writing the code that makes up the logic on servers or making up the logic that actually gets done in the browser. There's open source code, which is open for anyone to use. Uh, you can read more about that, start getting started on your own open source projects if you'd like. The challenges that come with scaling up for multiple servers and lots and thousands and thousands of web requests at any given time. That's a whole nother topic in itself. Moving code from your computer to a server <clears throat> is called deploying code. And that's something that there are lots of tools out there to make easier, but it's a, it can be a difficult thing to get, to get going on. Frameworks are available for programmers or for people doing pretty much any of these topics. And so because the internet is a pretty mature technology, there's ways to get all this stuff done more easily than there was 10 or 20 years ago. And so frameworks are kind of a jumping off point. And then there's just programming in general. There's object-oriented functions, conditional statements, loops, all these things, these ideas in programming that you probably will want to look into if you're interested in getting into web development in a deeper way. So for the last part of this presentation, I'd like to just show you guys 
how to make a very simple web page with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So our goal here is just to create a website that allows users to access hidden content if they submit their email address. You've probably seen more complicated versions of this same problem on websites with paywalls. So for example, uh, newspaper sites may have, please enter your payment information if you'd like to read this article or get more than one article a, a month or whatever it is. This is getting to be pretty common, so I figured it would be a good little example for our CMA conference. Uh, here's what we're going to end up building. In step one, you see a form with some instructions. Step two, you put in your email address. And then step three, you're going to get the password to all my websites. That's not really the password to all my websites, but you guys get the idea. It's hidden content. So what we need to make this work is a form with input for our email address or for an email address from the user and a submit button. That's, that's required. The next thing we need probably for usability is some actual instructions for the user telling them to put in their email address and we'll show them hidden content. And we also need the hidden content itself somewhere. And then finally we need to do some logic to make the hidden content appear and disappear. There are three tools we're going to use to create this basic website. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. HTML is hypertext markup language. It basically acts as the container for each element on the page, each piece of the page. We'll get into that in a second. CSS stands for cascading style sheets, and this makes the HTML look nice. JavaScript is the last part, and it's used for moving parts, the changing of a website. So when it starts, it's going to have hidden content, and after the JavaScript acts, it's going to reveal that content. So HTML uses what's called tags wrapped around plain text to tell the browser, which once again is like your reading glasses, how to show content. It's basically a framework for your house. You put it up and it gives you an idea of what the structure of the house is, but doesn't show you exactly what it's going to look like or the style of the house. It's necessary but at the core, but it's not the only thing that goes into a house. So each tag in HTML has attributes. So up top here, we have a, an example of some HTML code. And down below is what that HTML code actually looks like. As you can see, the, the uh, triangle brackets which just look like greater than and less than signs. Um, each of those opens up on the name of an HTML tag. So for example, the first one is h1, which means header one, the biggest header that HTML has. P means paragraph, and so anything within the opening and closed P bracket is going to be a one single paragraph. Now, you, have, you notice with all these HTML tags, we try to close them out with the slash and then the same name that we use to open it. That's just standard in HTML. The next section is a little more complicated, and this is where our form actually is. You see form name equals demo form, on submit equals return show content. I know this, this probably is a little, going to trip you up a little, but for now, just worry about the fact that this is where our form is, and we give it a name, we give it some special rules. Each of these are called elements um, that, that apply to this actual tag, so or attributes that apply to this tag. And we have a label for the email address to tell users this is where your email address goes. We have an input form uh, and a submit field. And the last thing on this page is p with class equals hidden. Now, we don't, haven't told the HTML document how to use class equals hidden, so it doesn't know what that means yet. It's kind of just a placeholder for now. So it's still showing the hidden paragraph at the end there. In order to make this look better, we're going to add CSS for styles. So CSS is like the facade of a house. It's the walls, the floor, the roof, and it's going to decide if the house looks rustic, modern, old, new, etc. Basically, it adds all the character that you didn't get out of the framework of the house. We can change the colors of the title, height of paragraph of text. We can make things centered, etc. Tons we can do. So I added a bunch of CSS to this page, but over on the left, you're just going to see some highlights from this. First h1 and then open bracket, what this means is anything within those brackets applies to any h1 tag. Remember how I said h1 are the biggest headers in HTML? Well, we've decided to make all of those big headers red with a font size of 175 percent, which means bigger than normal, and a text alignment of center. 
So as you can see, the the header one is now centered and uh, it's red. And then we added this dot hidden, which is going to apply now to our paragraph that had the class hidden. And we say display none, which means don't show it. So in the HTML, <clears throat> we added p class equals hidden, but it was still shown. The CSS actually allowed us to hide it. There's still no functionality in this form, though. If I click Submit, it wouldn't really do anything. It would just bring me back to the same page. And that's where JavaScript comes in. JavaScript is a browser-based programming language, and it's a little more complicated than HTML and CSS because this doesn't just handle look and feel. It actually handles a lot of logic, and it can be pretty complicated. It's a lot like the windows and doors to a house that, in that it adds mobility and interactivity to what was before a static object. So I made one function just to keep it simple. <clears throat> and I wouldn't expect you to understand everything that this does, but basically to walk you through, and if you'd like, you can pause it and read the comments because they're pretty verbose here. But when you click submit on that form and you've got an email address in it, it runs this function called show content. And it first saves the email address that you input in as a local variable. And if it actually was a valid email address, then it's going to hide the form itself and it's going to show the uh, hidden content. And so after we've submitted, it looks like the screenshot below. So that's pretty much it. If you missed anything on this, feel free to check out my website where I've got the whole video. I've got a bunch of resources posted. I've got links to things that are referenced here. carlhughescom slash 2015 slash CMA. This presentation was originally for the College Media Association uh, 2015 conference in New York City, but feel free to reuse it or whatever for your own purposes. Uh, thank you guys for watching. If you've got questions, uh, you can find my contact information at this website, carlhughescom slash 2015 slash CMA. Um, and also, if you are a college student, you're interested in renting your textbooks digitally, go to packbackbooks.com and you can learn more. Uh, if you're interested in this or anything else, you'd like some tips on where to get started, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, email is carl at packbackbooks.com or carl at packback.co and all that's on my website. Thanks again for watching and have a great afternoon.